Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode six of Conversations About America, where we talk about important and relevant topics. Our distinguished panel is Michael Landingham, presidential candidate in 2020 and again in 2024. Essence Reigns, podcaster and hostess of Deceptively Unique. Robert Gonzalez, author of a great book called Eagles Claws for Freedom's Cause. And Quentin Ford hosted a great talk show called Let's Talk. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. You've all been here before, so you know what's going on. Good evening. Yeah, hi. So tonight, we're going to be talking about suffrage. And I think we all probably read up on it, probably knew something about it anyway. Uh, I'm going to start out by asking a question. I'll let anybody that feels froggy jump in to start first. You know, we know that initially it was only white men who were property owners that could vote. And they kept it that way as long as they could, but slowly but surely things changed. Um, not all at the same time. Sometimes some states will be ahead of the others. But my question is, why do you think all men were given the right to vote before any women were given the right to vote? Hmm. Anybody want to jump on that one? Well, I'll, I'll say this, that uh, thinking back in the old ways, um, especially about women being in the kitchen, women don't have the right to vote, women don't have the same intellect structures of man as man, but women were the backbone of human society. I mean, women uh, brought life into this world and carried that life and nurtured that life. And it should be, it should have been a balance early on, but sticking to the old ways has kind of kept that progression of growth for women to be uh, to be known as equals and be treated as equals um, in every facet. So I think that's just, just thinking, keeping the old ways thinking that is like the best way, but only way to move forward is to think about everybody being uh, equal. And uh, it's just thinking about the old ways instead of thinking about change and fear and of the unknown also. Okay. Um. I think that men were given the right to vote before women because they were the the breadwinners. Like they, they were, the, were the the they were the breadwinners. Mm -hmm. They were the head of the household. That's not saying that a woman didn't have equal rights doing what it was that she was supposed to do. You know, um, like I said last week, equal doesn't always mean the same. So we were equal as men and women but we just had different rights. We had different activities that were you distinctly towards what we were. The men were the breadwinners and the women were the, the, the home caretakers. And I don't know, I'm sorry. That's my opinion. Well, that's why you're here. You don't have to be sorry. Uh, what do you think, Bob? Oh, no. I think... Um um, you, you know, society continues to evolve ever since, uh, you know, if you believe the Bible, the woman came from the man's rib and, it, you know, mankind and womankind has been evolving ever since. Men, you know, for the longest time took the lead on things. And I think it was created that way for a reason. That's not to say that uh, women are any less equal to men. They're just different. Uh, but as far as the right to vote, uh, you know, they, they should have an equal right just like a man does. So are you saying that it was the God's plan that men were given the right to vote before women? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm thinking that it, things have evolved since then. I think that men took the lead in societies, you know, from the caveman days throughout even the, the modern times. Uh, you know, women were in the home more and, you know, the men usually spoke for the family. It was a societal thing. I'm not saying whether it was right or wrong. It's just the way society was structured. And women in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years have been coming out more. They've been in the workforce more and their voices have been, you know, voiced more, which included the right to vote. Okay. Quentin, what do you think, brother? 
I think that um, the new world, as we would consider America back then, up until recently, recently was trying to do what the other um, societies were always known, technically known by their men. Um, so it was it was basically just fallen suit with others other great civilizations at the time and um, the right to vote. Even if you look at the M the Roman Empire, always was the men in the Senate or whatever voting. I don't think that it was a slight to women at the time, but I think um, like like Bob said, as human beings evolve, I think it was hold up. We're in society too. And we're part of society too. We should have a right to vote as well. And I think that that was the initial, um, I guess, the birth of the suffrage, as you would say. Okay. Now we also know that even after black men were allowed to vote, some white racists were always coming up with ways to deny them to vote. And such as literacy tests. Essence, how would you feel if you went to vote and somebody said, well, we got to give you a test and see if you're are literate or educated? Um, I think that that was just what came with the territory at the time. Um, everything did for every uh, right that they gave the black man and black woman, they had uh, something else in place to, to stop them from actually executing that right fully. Okay. Michael? Well, yeah, I agree also. And uh, at the same time, uh, they used to give us like jelly beans to like guess how many jelly beans in the jar. Or if our grandfather's like a, a grandfather clause, like if, if our grandfather's never vote, we can't vote. Or some some kind of weird weird crazy thing, and the only reason why is because <clears throat> they really okay. The Civil War started overall basically because people got tired. There were white people who did believe that the 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 suffrages the suffrages of African American slaves were wrong, were unjustifiably wrong, and so therefore they had to find a way to fight uh, for the right for the rights of everybody, and so. When that happened, you still got people right now who still believes that we're not the same. We're not equally smart or intelligent as these same individuals who claim that they're smart and intelligent. Or we're not supposed to be part of the vote. So they fear something they don't understand. And just like, okay, give me an example. 1964, that was kind of the last thing uh, with the Civil Rights Act and the, and the Voting Rights Act, 65 the Voting Rights Act. That was the last thing African Americans really got. Besides Barack Obama, so to speak, some people may agree this way. But they took that back in 2012, the Voting Rights Act. They, they, they said there's no racism here to see. They're, 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 everything is still the same as it is today, like it was before. It's just more lies and more delusion and, and more uh, confusion. And I think we're we're we are we are we are evolving to something what our forefathers envisioned, uh, what civil rights leaders envisioned. Uh, it, it wasn't going to be easy, but um, I, I know the right leadership and the right people to step up that uh, we could do better than what our ancestors did. And also, uh, the white people are right now looking for a way that we can come together, blacks and whites. So it's more it's more. This time, and more time, in, any time in American history, that we are we are ready to come together. But we got to have people that wants to bring us together. And um, but like I said, behind the scenes, it's still going on. Yeah. Quentin, do you think we're already trying to come together? No. <laughs> no. I think that um. I think that America is more divided now than they were in the civil rights movement. Um, the civil rights movement kind of got accelerated because it was a whole bunch of different things going on at once. So it was like a combustional fire that just happened and then Vietnam and all this other stuff. But I think that like um, 
you know, I think America, I think the American people are tired of their politicians. Uh, but I don't think far as unity as a nation, we're there. Um, just when we just look at the Civil Rights Act, the Voters' Right Act, um, the John Lewis Act, just think about it for a second. These are acts for voting, not a law, an act. Something that when you sit back and think about it, say if you had someone from, I'll just say Norwegian. Norwegian comes here in the 70s. They become an American citizen. Their child is an American citizen. Their child never has to worry about an act allowing them to vote over a traditional Black person. They may, have, they may not be able to vote because of an act. So the division really hasn't changed, in, in my opinion. I mean, I think it, 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 what happens is like that Black eye usual. If you don't tend to the black eye, it's gonna it's gonna continue being black. It's there, but not my opinion. I mean, even now, Steve, we talked about it before we went on air. You got the vaccinated going against the unvaccinated. Yeah. It's always a war and a division, a, a rich versus poor type of thing, and it's always something going on. Yeah. It's that whole divide and conquer thing it, it, that keeps getting played out in so many ways. Yeah. Rich against the poor, Republicans against the Democrat, black against the white, and Mexicans against the Asians. I mean, you name it, anything they can come up with to divide us so we won't join together against them, you know, they're going to do it. Yeah. Well, that's their, that's their plan overall. And uh, like I, I agree with you, brother, that the the, 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 the our politics are still divided. That's on purpose. Yeah. But deep down, talking to these people, uh, voters, Republicans and Democrats, and, and, and I get cussed out by a lot of uh, libertarians, but I love to engage somebody different. Trust and believe. You got the right people there that can um, remind of who we are and what our purpose is in life. It's the first, yes, we have uh, division. Yes, we have disagreement, but we first must talk it out. We must not let our politicians or our local leaders be the ones to set the line like for us to start the conversation. We ourselves or, or our own leaders, and and uh, that's what we need to start the conversation ourselves, not depending on these politicians, because all they're doing is playing this big game, which is about to fall. Yeah. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with what everybody's saying. Um, I think right now, though, we're, we're, we're more than in the civil rights or probably any other era, America's fighting for its identity because there's such infiltration from around the world that America's lost kind of, they don't know who they are, but we're, we're fighting through it. And when, you know, all these things with the election and everything that's going on, when all this gets fixed, I think we'll be a stronger, more united country on the other side of this. So you think there's a lot of in the tunnel? Yeah, but it's not easy to see right now, and it might get a lot worse before we start seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. It might be a little while till we get there, but I think we're on our way there. Well, I hope you're right, but I'm kind of agree with Quentin that we're more divided now than ever. And I don't see a lot of people wanting to come together. I see a lot of people on the left saying, well, I don't want to be on the same side as Ted Cruz or Marjorie Green, you know, I don't want to be making peace with them. And, you, you know, you have people like Ted Cruz saying, I don't want nothing to do with AOC, that silly socialist woman, you know, you got people saying all this kind of stuff. And I don't see a lot of people wanting unity. I just well, you got to you gotta understand, you got to get, you got the people like Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green. Ted Cruz, they were they they were meant to be there to keep those constituents divided and in fear and attack the other side. You put a light on them who they really are. I promise you, the those people, those constituents that have been following them, they'll drop them like a bad habit every day. Republicans waking up to the fact about Donald Trump. It may not take overnight, but it took some time for them to be fooled. Still, it takes some time for them to be unfooled. Now you ain't gonna be able to unfool all of them. You're not going to ever be uh, working with Ted Cruz and all the rest of them. 
you show them you show them who they really are to the American people on both sides, well, the Republican side mostly, and show them that they're on the wrong path. But the only way that they can have some kind of reassurance that they don't feel alienated from the other side is that um, we on the on the other side must not attack the uh, Republican vote, even though they attack us. We got to show that we understand the difference between we got fooled and the difference between of not being fooled. They got fooled. They got duped, played. I mean, Democrats, we got duped and played too in some degree or form. But we are, we're learning from them our mistakes. And, and how they're feeling, they feel like ashamed and embarrassed. So I, my main thing is we open up the dialogue and talk it out. I believe it can work out. Not overnight, yeah. but I believe it can work out through time. Well, I believe theoretically it could. And I, I just can't be optimistic. I wish I could. So I hope you're right. I, hope you're I ain't got no choice. I ain't got no choice but to be after my story. I mean, you know. So there was another thing that they did. Some of them, they required black voters to get a white person to vouch for them. What do you think that was all about? Is that just another way to keep people from voting? Or is there more to it? You mean when when, when that happened? Yeah, well, I was getting ready to say I'm I'm learning. I'm like more of a you know a audience tonight. Um y'all are font of information. I've actually never heard of that. Yeah, heard that. Steve, that Steve was something that was going on in the South, I think in the 30s and the 40s. Yeah, Steve, Steve is talking about pre pre what a lot of people don't know is that. Um, the Voting Rights Act, pre-1964, if you were Black and you owned land, after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, if you were Black and owned land, and then you were a man, you were eligible to vote in certain areas. It's, it's like one of America's best-kept secrets, because if you quiz most people on this, they'll be like, no, no Black man was able to vote until the 60s. That's not true. So in certain places... You would have to get what they call a black, a white, a white another landowner as a sponsor, yeah, for you to for you to be able to vote, yeah. And, um, I mean, <laughs> me personally, I just think it's it's another way of basically control. Um, it it it, it it's hard for me to try to get understand it because I don't understand the voting thing. I think the voting thing has always been something more of a dream like even even when you talk about politicians now when you don't hear from politicians till election cycle so they always like stir the pot and then once the election cycle's over they disappear so i always thought so i think that most people even electoral college most people don't understand how the electoral college works they think that their vote means a different a, a, a difference and it's basically those delegates within your state can actually go against the majority and I think that if a lot of people understood the electoral college I think the the majority of American people would have a problem with how the electoral college is ran yeah because it's not one man one one man one vote yeah. so to say in this country yeah. and women as well like it would be with a true democracy. Yeah. Essence, what do you think? Um, I agree with Quentin. Um, I'm sitting here and, and I'm taking notes uh, because I don't understand how the electoral college votes are ran. So I'm, I'm learning right now. So I'm, I'm gonna give some input later, but right now I am listening to y'all. Okay. Uh, do you see any connect, well, not connection, but any parallel between what's going on nowadays as far as all these laws that the Republicans are coming up with from state to state and the way they're making it harder for certain people to vote? Uh, is that any parallel, do you think, Bob? Well, I don't know. Uh what what they're doing to make it more difficult to vote. I know that they're asking for voter ID and to show proof of citizenship and those type of things. And I, I don't see why for people who have a legitimate vote, why what's so hard about that? 
I think that everybody should, you need an ID to pretty much get anything, a driver's license, uh, to go cash a check at a bank, whatever, you know, why shouldn't you need an ID to vote? What do you think, Matt? Well, overall, you know, I, I, I think that all these extra laws are pretty much uh, uh, a junior of the Jim Crow laws overall. Um, we, we already have IDs, a driver license, a state ID, right? And they're saying that, well, we need proof of our being a citizen and be able to vote. Well, you got your social security card and you got your ID. You bring those two in, that's it. Now getting an extra ID and then another ID and then some other thing is only adding more of a barrier for minorities Especially if they talk about adding all these features and you got to have money, especially poor people don't have money. Uh, they ain't gonna be able to do that. Then cutting down early voting, voting on Sunday, 24 hour voting, uh, voting by mail, a lot of older, older people, even, even having our uh, election day as a holiday. So everybody don't have to work, everybody can vote. That is what our democracy should be embracing. But the Republicans, the Republicans have no idea. The only idea is tax cuts and knowing how to take away from poor people to pay for. That's the only two things that they've got their ideas wrapped around them. The American people, Republicans and Democrats, are waiting for some ideas. But you're supposed to have a two-party system. You're supposed to argue out the idea in order for us to solve the most dire crisis that we, we're facing today as a nation. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. When, when you got one party has no idea, so the only idea they can do is a lie, cheat, kill, and destroy. Period. Destroying the very foundation of what democracy stands for, because they, though these type of of, of, of so-called Republicans, or really, this this is not new. This is the same people who believe in the Confederation for the Constitution. I don't know if y'all know about that. It was more power to give to the states. States get control with the voting. States get control of more of everything than the federal. That was going to soon collapse, and then they created the Constitution. And ever since then, those same people who thought that have been around ever since then teaching the same old thing. They don't have any ideas to, for, uh, to make uh, America to do progress towards the future and to catch up with the rest of the world. They want to live backwards and to keep us um, uh, in, in, in devastation of our democracy, only because of fear. Yeah. Essence, what about women's voting rights? How did that happen? Educate us on that. Um, so from the research that I did, uh, I believe was is the 19th Amendment was ratified. So, so women get were given the right to vote on August 18th, 1920. Um, it wasn't it wasn't black women, it was white women that was given the right to vote. Yeah. And I, if, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, when they had passed that law to allow those white women to vote, they had to vote as their husbands told them to vote. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did they really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, used to, I, I used to read up a lot of old, uh, a lot of old uh, encyclopedias growing up. I just like to read growing up. And uh, yeah, that's what happened. Wow. I don't think that would go over too well today, do you? No. <laughs> no. I think I think one of the uh, the the issues about voting, um, definitely when it comes from America, America right now has a um, a messaging problem um, from the from the right side of the aisle. I don't think that they think what they're doing is considered voter suppression. And from the left side of the aisle, I think voter saying it's voter suppression can be a little, it'll scare people. And it'd be like, what the hell are they doing? What, why is the right doing this? And it'll scare you into a frenzy. I think, I think that one of the issues is it goes back all the way to one of the reasons why the Civil War was, fight, was, was fought and it's still going on is because allowing the states to have particular rights without fe federal government interference. And I think that is 
is still the main issue. And it's st- and it's an issue of if you live in an area, for example, where I grew up at is a heavily populated area. I mean, literally, I could walk 150 feet and vote. Where I live at now, same thing. The church across the street from my house is an is a polling site. However, when you live in rural areas, areas where there is no v, VWA, v, it is no Elks Club, it is no school, it is no polling site. When you have rules where you can't have a van pick up 15 people and you guys go vote in a crowd, I mean... I could understand how um, people with money, people who are trying to sway elections can sway the voters by picking them up, by buying them lunch. I can understand it. I, I really could. However, we need to make it easier for each individual in our country to be able to vote. It should be as simple as an ID. One of the most craziest things that most of us don't know is most people don't have ID. Most people don't have a, a regular driver's license. Definitely live in a rural area. You may only go to your general store and that's it. Um, you may live, live off of a fixed income. So if you're in an urban area and you live off a of fixed income and you can't get to the motor vehicle, it may sound totally crazy to us, but this is a, a normal practice in rural areas, even so much that we we may not believe it. Something I do in my job is half of the country don't even have internet. And that sounds crazy for us to be doing a podcast on a Zoom that half of the country don't have internet and we're afforded the opportunity to have it. But just think about it. Half of the country doesn't have internet. Half of the country doesn't even know what's going on outside of their local news. So when you talk about voting, we should try to do, the country should try to do, they need a unifier that will be able to say, we want to allow, we want to get it where every American citizen should be able to vote no matter where they're at and make it as easy as possible for that person to vote. You know, I agree with that, uh, uh, Quentin, uh, because, you know, that's why I said about my 2020 run that everybody should be able to vote. And especially with, you know, when we had COVID and we had to make it easier for everybody to vote because everybody couldn't stand in line and, and, and spread the virus and stuff like that. So my plan was to make sure that everyone can be able to vote. Why not, can you not set up something online, like set up something from the website through the election offices or whatnot and vote like on your cell phone or vote uh, at your computer desk? In the comfort of your home, anytime you want to, you have time to review the people that are on the ballot, look at some of the people right there live and decide if you wanted to vote for that person or not. Also, to make not just voting easy, but to make regular people get up, get involved in politics, and run for these offices that these so-called leaders are holding. There should be ways and methods so that money won't block regular good folks like me and you that can get up there and run. And it's in our constitution to do that. People, I get tired of people saying that you gotta be in government, you gotta have this, these degrees. No, you just gotta have common sense in your ABCs and one, two, three, that's it. And the bravery and the knowledge and being a unifier, but also to access all, everything with voting, you gotta have access to everything about entering the game. It's making it fun. And that's the only way. Instead of recycling the same old, same old, same old people, and this is why these same old people poison the well in such a degree that we turn off, especially the people that are not aware, especially 50, 50% of uh, individuals across this country who don't have internet. They're not aware. They're turned off of politics because they made it so poison that we don't want nothing to do with it. That's on purpose. We need to be brave and stand against that and, 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 and fight, just like our ancestors did Blacks and whites to get to where we are now. Did you know that in 1890, the state of Wyoming make, made it legal for women to vote? In 1890, women could vote in Wyoming. Did you know? No, that? I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I knew some Western states was like early 
uh, late, you know, 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, but I know, I know, you know, that one. That yeah. One. Well, Wyoming was the first, and like you say, there were some Western states that came after, but 1920 is when it was granted to all women. Uh, something that I found out, I don't know, I think it was history.com or something, says historians argue that places like Wyoming and other Western states were more likely to grant women's suffrage, not only because they were newer and more open to embracing equal rights for women, but because such states, which were often sparsely populated, wanted to attract more women to move there. Isn't that interesting? Sounds like ladies and I at the local bar and club, doesn't it? <laughs> my, my. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you this. Do you think the Civil War would have happened if women were, had been allowed to vote? before that? Uh, ah. Just, just my opinion, I don't think so. Um, women in certain instances are always going to choose because we're nurturers by nature, we're going to choose non-violence over violence. So if women were given the, and, and it, it was because of that, that choosing the, the non-violence over violence we, when it comes to certain positions in the government, just my opinion, some of us women should not be in those positions. I know that's totally left field, but because we, it's harder for us to make the tougher decisions, like that war did or did not need to happen. So are you saying that women are more compassionate than men, essence? Yes. Really? Yes, it's, it's the nurturing side of us. Hmm. Why think about that, Quentin? You're smiling. <laughs> uh, I think that's I think that's interesting. Um, never I never really looked at looked at that that uh, way of thinking until you just posed the question. I think that um, one of the issues, and I don't want to take away from the question, one of the issues that got got that really got the women during the suffrage movement started was how the hell can a, a ex slave vote and I wasn't able to vote. I think that was kind of like one of the things that like, it didn't make sense to them. Um, if you look at Susan B. Anthony and some of the things that she said and how she felt, she felt some type of way about the likes of Frederick Douglass and others and like, who the hell are they? Who the hell are them? And I think this is kind of like what spearheaded their movement. And um, it caught on steam because it did allow a lot of women to be like, hold up, we're, you know, even though we may not believe or can or condemn racism or condone racism, why aren't we able to vote but an ex-slave can vote? That in their eyes, it didn't make much sense. We're supposed to be our white husband counterparts. So it's like, what the hell is going on here? So do you think now, right now in America, a lot of states has laws that says that if you are convicted felon, you cannot vote. Do you think that's right? Is that taxation with that representation? Well, I, I believe, uh, look, if you, 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 you committed a crime, you do the time. After you do the time, you pay your dues to society. And uh, this is one of my plans overall as president, that your record should be, it's got to be something like a letter from the Justice Department to allow you to work without having the hiccups about your past, right? So that should include voting. You paid your dues, you should be able to vote. Only under, if it's not like a... Uh, violent situation when you when it comes to like murder if you, if you murder somebody you took someone else's life and you took them you took uh, took their right of voting as well and their right of living so and, uh, not those people not murderers not those kind of people uh deserve the right to vote but like you know the criminals yeah you, know, you pay your dues should be able to vote one of the uh, which is interesting this question here right 
and I get to answer this from somebody that has been in trouble. Um, one of the myths in America is that we are a second chance society. And the reason why I say it's a myth, it's the biggest joke of them all. America is not a second chance society. America is a society, unfortunately, that we, those principles that say that we forgive and forget are subjective on who you are and what people think of you. You can be a convicted felon, and as long as you know the right people or have money, people will, will forgive and forget. You can be a regular Joe who has truly changed your life around, don't have money, and people will still hold you accountable for something. Um, unfortunately, you are who your life dictates you are. I mean, it's, it, it sounds crazy, but I'm speaking from experience. Um, I'm speaking from a person who just was not able to vote because I was on parole at one time. So I know how people are treated from having felony convictions. Um, you know, they did some things in New Jersey and even now where you, you can be on parole and, and, and vote. And I really, I truly believe that when you start getting into people who are convicted felons to vote, people who, are, who aren't American citizens to vote, because they even have that in some places, I think that's all about the vote. I don't think it's about the person. Um, certain people, certain politicians will do anything to get votes and say anything to get votes and get any group of people who have been marginalized to get votes. Because if it's, it's just this theory. If you vouch for me, Steve, I'll be loyal to you for the rest of your life. And that's just how people are. I, I, I hate to say it, and this is why they do these voting graphs and all that and say this demographic of people, majority of them will vote for this party because they're able to say, as long as we feed this, and, and even um, Nancy Pelosi came out during the week and she said that the Hispanic community is going to be the majority in America. Now we've seen all type of modules, anybody that knows anything about politics have seen all types of modules that have been saying this for the last 10 years. But her finally, her saying it, she knows what she's doing. She's catering to her base. She's catering for her party's base going forward into the midterms and into the next general election. So I, to answer your question, Steve, I think that it's all a bunch of crock. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be negative. I just think that um, a lot of times people will say and do and allow people to say and do just to get what they want from that person. Yeah. I mean, you got companies that are hire ex felons and get tax and get federal tax grants for hiring them, but then fire them within a year after they got the money. They'll they'll fire them for something stupid or or whatever. Yeah. So, are we really a society who give people second chances? I I don't think so. What do you think about that, Bob? Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, if, if, a felon, if a felon has served his time and paid all the dues that he was convicted for, maybe they, they, need, they need to look at uh, allowing the vote for that person. It's got to be a, a process, though, where it, it needs to be looked at and shouldn't be taken lightly. The, the whole thing, in a nutshell, to me, is to make it easier for legitimate people to vote while making it harder for illegitimate people to cheat. And that, that's, yeah. You have your your paper ballots. You have people who are, are have been dead for who knows how long who get to vote. You have all kinds of illegals. I mean, even in that last this last election, you know, former heavyweight champion Joe Frazier got to vote, and he he's he, in Pennsylvania, he in Philadelphia, he's been dead now for what like ten years, and he got a vote. I mean, and that's just one of many examples all across the country. There's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of votes that that don't belong there, and that needs to be streamlined. So they, because it, the people who are legitimate vote, their votes get canceled out. Okay.
like to add to what Quentin was saying. Um, and really the only thing that I like to add is it's harder for the black man and being able to vote after being a convicted felon because one, the black man is not judged by the same judging system that his white counterparts are. Like a black man will go to jail for something a white man will just get a fine for. And that happens a lot. So have any of you had any first-hand experience of being denied the right to vote or has it made it, anybody made it harder on you deliberately that you know of? I know one thing, Steve, to be honest with you, after I just said what I said about being a convicted felon and not being able to vote when I was in New Jersey at a, at a certain time, voting in Pennsylvania has been the easiest thing. Really? It's easy to get a driver's license. I must admit, like I told you guys, I live across the street from a voting poll, but I actually voted by mail, just just this uh, general election. And after I voted, I mean, I got a couple letters a couple weeks after that. It was really very, very easy. So for me, like I, I said earlier, when I'm not in a rural area, but I work in rural areas, um, it's not as easy as people may think it is when it comes to voting. I mean, it's a lot of where I work at, um, borderline upstate New York and Pennsylvania. It's a lot of seniors. I mean, Bob knows the area pretty well. He'll tell you. It's a lot of older people, a lot of retirement homes up that way. And they aren't, they aren't going to the cities. They're staying, they're just going to the general store and maybe the post office. They don't come out much. They might ride their bike, go on a trail here and there, but they ain't, it's not as easy as we think it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 uh, the problem with voting, not really, but running, you know, what happened to me, um, that was that was that was difficult. I'm still going through that. Um, no matter who you are, if it's not a part of the same power structure or what they perceive or what and how the world is, then you are against them, and they're gonna work tirelessly hard to make sure that your vote will not count, or if you decide to run against them. And so, you know, it's uh, I, I I I never had a problem with voting, but running for public office, yeah, that's. Being threatened by the former president, yeah, that's that's pretty weird. That's you can't get any harder than, than stopping somebody than that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to give everybody a final word on the subject. So, Quentin, what's your summary on suffrage and voting rights? How would you wrap it up? Um. Get rid of electoral college, number one. That's That would be first and foremost, one man, one vote. Um, and I would say one man, meaning one woman as well. If you're an American citizen, you have a right, you have a, a moral right and a human right to vote for who you want to choose to vote for and nobody should be persecuting you for your vote. Vote shamming, uh, voter suppression, all that, whoever agrees to all that stuff need to be, excuse my language, they need to be tied up and whipped I think that if you vote for the man in the moon, that's who you choose to vote for. Um, I just think it's 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 crazy that we're talking about something that has been going on for the last 150 years in this country. And the more things that we think change, the more it remains the same. I mean, the John Lewis Voting Right Act has still not been signed. It's still in the House. And it's kind of scary that if this act runs out, there is a large portion of our country who are not going to be allowed to vote. And I think that's really sad that these politicians in Washington continue to drag their feet on the minor issues, instead of the major issues. Okay. Essence, what's your final summary of it all? Um, first, I'd like to thank these gentlemen tonight for educating me because I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Um, I don't have much uh, to, to say on it, except that uh, I agree with Quentin. If you're American, you should have the right to vote, period. Okay, Bob? Uh, I usually agree with Quentin, but on this one, I...
I, I have to disagree. I think we need the electoral college. I think um, it gives the lesser populated of areas of the country a, a voice. I think if you get rid of the electoral college and you had the one person, one vote thing that in the large population centers or in certain areas of the country, they would be able to just overwhelmingly vote for one candidate and with the others, less populated areas of the country having no say. And I don't think we, we, that would be a good thing. Michael? Well, overall, um, voting is an essential right of every American. And when it comes to the uh, Electoral College, let me just say this, Electoral College was made to be a peace breaker to try to make the country whole after, civil, after the Civil War, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they kind of, the Republicans kind of Jerry, uh, what do you call it? Jerry? Jerry Mandering. There you go. Jerry Mandering their districts. And in order for state legislators, see, see state legislators are the, the uh, electoral college voters, okay, in each state. If you got a Republican in control of this state or a Democrat controlling that state, then each one of those people can vote for uh, that president or that, yeah, or one of the presidents, Democrat Republican. Yeah, to take that away, and I said that I said a few years ago we should abolish the electoral college. But just like uh, the other gentleman said, th that will still take away the voices from small net communities in the Midwest of the country instead of the most populated areas around the country. So we got to find a balance somewhere, some way. Um, and we're too divided to, to really like listen to each other to find that balance. Unless we hear of a story that can hit the soul of America, that can wake, wake up America and say, wait a minute. I thought we were what we thought we were. No, we're not. We're, we're in a terrible place right now. How can we come together? And the story is, the only story I can think of right now is landinghamcase.com. Just take a look at it. But also, I want to say that what the Republicans are doing with the voting rights and then especially knocking down the truth about January 6th is a disgraceful moment in American history. And the only way that we can overcome that is for all of us, Republicans, Democrats, independents, all hands on deck. And then if we can come together, we can defeat anything that's in front of us, especially people that are trying to stop us from voting. And that's the main thing that we get to focus on. Okay. Well, personally, I think any person in America that pays taxes, male or female, if they're paying taxes, they should have the right to vote, period. That's the way I feel about it. Now, thank you all for your comments. And I do want you all to help me choose topics. So how about we give Essence the opportunity to go first? Essence, what do you want to talk about next week? Um, I want to talk about the Willie Lynch letter. Okay. It's a very interesting letter and a very controversial letter. So that's- It is. Yeah. Okay. Has everybody heard of the William, I mean, the Willie Lynch letter? No. No? You ever heard of it, Bob? Essence is, Essence is going for juggler very early. <laughs> well, you can read no, the letter. But whatever it is that I learned, I really want to share. I just found out about it and it was like a light bulb went off because I started seeing the evidence, the evolution of it. So yeah. you know, I, I encourage you all to read the letter and also listen to it. You can find it on uh, YouTube. Um, it's very interesting. So I look forward to that and I thank you all for being my guest. So you great all show. Have, I have a great week. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in to Conversations About America. Please tune in each and every Sunday evening for your weekly dose of educational entertainment. Good night to everybody and have a wonderful week. Good night. Good night.